No, I don't think I was surprised. Clearly the enemy was surprised. We're going for a fight. Losing 48 friends and colleagues, that was horrendous. Once you dropped a fire mission, the enemy would go up and inspect the craters. And there was a massive firefight going on. There was just rounds and shit going. There is a white flag flying over Stanley. <laughs> Bloody marvellous. <laughs> It's great. It's great you come on the show, mate. Because I, I, I get a lot of bloody because of the nature of the military stuff we do. Yeah, which is quite ironic because, as everybody knows, I, I, I'm, I'm all for peace. I think as adults we can find a better way than blowing a hell. But yeah. more importantly, you know, I'm a. Um, it's not something I dine out on, and but I've suffered trauma in my life, you know, and and. When people go, oh, I was in the Marines and do... now nah, that stuff I handled, it, uh, I, I, I shouldn't sound blasé, but it, it like didn't bother me yeah. Be, being in the scrap. And, you know, we lost a lad over there in Ireland. It, yeah. it, you know, I'm not going to say it was great, but it, to me, that was just like the job. Right. Yeah. But it's it's the fact that I know how much a childhood can damage you right and set you up with challenges for life it's not a complaint because as i tell everyone i live in paradise now so i use all, all my experiences have brought me to a wonderful place you know and if i if i hadn't had horrible experiences as a toddler i, I wouldn't be the guy i am now you know doing the job that i love talking to great people like you with a family that i just never could have bloody dreamt about and 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 i've achieved all my goal you know pretty much all my goals really um but i get a lot of messages following like the falklands podcasts this sort of thing from young people that say oh chris you mentioned my dad in your podcast he died in the so-and-so or you know he was in a chopper that went down in the folk and my message to all of them or my reply is Come on my show. Yeah. You know, these are the stories we need to hear. Not, not the heroes running up mountains, black, you know, blatting off rounds at Argentinians or whatever it is. That that's, you know, you can get that in any Rambo film. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I know. You know, uh, we we uh, we need to hear the real cost of war. Um yeah. and not not just in a war context, but as parents, we need to know how to deal with our children and, 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 and what, you know, the slightest thing that you do badly can impact upon them, you know, um, yeah. for, 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 for their lives. So when you came forward and said your dad was a bootneck, he was down south, um, he took his life, um, but only after you, you know, you'd had to go through a, a fair few ups and ups and downs with him, him battling his PTSD. I, I'm just delighted to have you on the show. And can I just take this moment to anybody else out there? If, if you have a similar story to Sean's um, and you want to come on the show, yes, please, please do. Because when you won't run away from trauma your whole life, because, oh, God, I will, you know, it, what, what that does in our brain is it cements the flight or flight, fight yeah. or flight mechanism that, like, chatting with a guy on a podcast is, like, the worst thing in the world. It's going to kill us. And that programs our brain to think that that's a threat, right? When it's not, it's just two guys like we are now having a chat. Um. And this is the effect, this is the nature of trauma, is it, is it really screws people up for life. And a lot of people spend that life then just running away from anything that might be slightly uncut. And, and it, it's all bad programming. So 
what I'm trying to say is, mate, is congratulations on, I think, being the first that actually went, yeah, I'll come on the show. Um, perhaps that's partly due into the fact that we're shipmates. You you served in the Navy. Um, but welcome, mate. Cheers. Thank you. 4 a.m. April the 2nd, 1982. Argentine Navy cameramen film their invasion of the Falkland Islands. Frogmen landed first from a submarine, followed later by the main assault force. Now, the, the situation, as you might hear, is that the radio station has now been uh, taken over. If you take the gun out of my back, I'm going to transmit it to you. But I'm not speaking with a gun in my back. By 7 a.m., after fierce fighting, Government House was completely surrounded. In London, there were rowdy scenes in Parliament, swiftly followed by resignations. The government turned to the armed forces. Yes. What 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 did you do in the navy other than you know kiss boys? <laughs> no, I understand that. Well, actually, I mean my trade was survival equipment, so I I worked uh, closely with air crew and stuff like that. I mean, I did some land survival and some sea survival stuff. So basically, as an SE, you're packing life rafts, parachutes, and stuff. And anything that you get air crew to do, you've got to do yourself. So obviously, I never did stash training, but I did air, AR five drills, Dunker, Air four two seven, which was running around New Forest and then getting stripped naked afterwards and screamed and shouted at interrogation, which was quite good, actually, because the interrogation bit, that was easy compared to the way the old man treated me. So I got marked above average for from Joint Services Interrogation Organisation. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, basically bread and butter is parachutes, my brass, and then pool, dry breeze, pool drills, sea drills, working, you know, with air crew closely. So, yeah, I did a... A few ships, company drafts, squadrons of 771, search and rescue, A14, bounce around uh, illustrious arc, mm. and then uh, out in the Middle East a bit at uh, Oman. So yeah, it's a bit, yeah, your bread and butter is sort of like life rafts and stuff, but you can go on to do the survival and get yourself to America and that. So I did the training later on in life because what we used to be offered years ago was the combat survival instructor, which is, I think, the last two weeks of selection. So I, as times have changed over the years, they changed it to all SEER. So I did a, I did a few SEER courses and that, but it's all stuff I should have done in my earlier career, not like later on in life. So I, I did them again. You think you're just going around again. You think, I've done all this malarkey, but, you know, organisations change and it's like, yeah, I'm bored now. And I did, I, actually, I did have an opportunity to work with Fleet Protection Group Royal Marines, but I was having <laughs> some mental health problems and some marriage problems, and I just said to, I think it was Colossal Col Wolverine, so that now's not a good time. So I got a new one ripped and then went back to Cold Rose. I had a big bust up with my wife and then had to move to Cold Rose. So, yeah, I mean, from the trauma aspect, it has affected me with a lot of stuff, but I try not to let it beat me. You know, I've had peaks and troughs throughout my career and, you know, I could have gone on to do other bits and pieces, but it is that impact, I think, from seeing your old man come back from uh, the Falklands and, it was it really wasn't good, you know. I think for me, the age of fourteen, seeing my dad grabbing one by the throat with a tea towel, we're in Paul Walsh and place at uh, Paul Mary Quarters, so I had to leg it up to the guard room and say, "I think my dad's trying to kill my mum." I was fourteen at the time, like nine and a half stone. My dad's fifteen stone, so I leapt out of bed, screamed like a girl. He put the windows in and Mary Quarter the doors. I'd run by the throat. I mean, what do you think when you see that? You know what I mean? And it's... Yeah, of course, mate. And, uh, and I know to a lot of people watching now, um, 
this is familiar territory, mate. <laughs> you know, this is this is domestic violence, and um, no, exactly, yeah. you know, me, many people out there, including myself, have, have have seen this. I'm just thinking, mate. Should we not mention your surname? Um, not not because I don't want to do you any discredit, but I don't want people to watch us and think like we're slagging off of the Royal Marines or any no. shit like. I know it's tricky, isn't it? And the thing is, I mean, it's still obviously a lot of my dad's mates around. I mean, Ian Hopkins, you might know him. He was my next door neighbour at Paul. There's Pete Radford, who's now in Denmark. I think Mike Fletcher, who's up in, still in our brave, I met a few years ago when in the British Legion. He uh, told me some uh, stories and I left there in bits. I thought, thanks, Fletch. So, yeah, honestly, not, not a problem. And obviously, I didn't yeah, want no, to. No, no, all, all it is is that I. I, I'm big on mental health. I've studied it. I've worked it. I've written, you know, three fucking books about it. And it's really important to understand that as horrible as behaviours may seem, and 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 they're awful, the individual is still a bit, you know, is still suffering. Um, it's like those people who go, oh, well, you know, drug addicts, they take all the drugs. It's, oh, fuck off, you know. No, no, it's, fucking it's grow up, you stupid you know, it, it, what, what people 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 try to get their lives to such a low, d- depraved level that they're dying on the street, and you think they freaking choose that? You, you know, you're an idiot, right? So, all, all, all I'm saying is, I, I just want to recognise here that you know, if you're a bloody 18, 19 year old lad down south in the Falklands, it was ferocious. Um, obviously not for everybody, but for some, it really was hand to hand stuff. Um, I've heard stories that just bloody hell, you know, I know I've got mates my age that won't even talk about it because they're so damaged by it all, you know, and, and, um, this takes nothing away from the pride that I feel at my fellow Royals, what, what they did, you know? Uh, it's the only podcast that bring me to tears, Sean, you know? Um, so all I thought is, is, you know, um, maybe we, maybe I'm doing this wrong, maybe, but, but, um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to like highlight one particular individual, if that makes sense. This is, this is some. This is something across the board. Uh, it's something we've got to get to grips with. We've still got people now taking sides in in the Ukraine, and they just don't get it, mate. They don't get that when they're going, yeah, go on, bomb them. But this is men, women, and children that are just getting blattered into smithereens, and there's repercussions. And I don't care about the adults because they're all big enough and ugly enough to deal with it themselves. And but the bloody children, I, I really, you know, they, they get so overlooked. Of course. You know, and I get people again on my show, oh, Chris, I'm a military brat. And I'm like, don't say that. That's been programmed into you because you've been to so many different freaking schools. You've been bullied so many different times that that you, you think that you're, I don't know what, maybe it's pre- precocious or what. It, 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 it is part of you and it's not it's just a reaction to the yeah. trauma that you you've bloody been through as a as a child but anyway so just tell me did you say dunker drills then or did, did i yeah, I used to do dunker training that because obviously but it's quite funny because obviously anything air crew do like obviously pool drills sea drills as an se when you're getting promoted that like, you have to go and do it alongside obviously your professional training your leadership training so yeah working basically trying to drown air crew obviously if an air crew craft ditches air crew needs to know how to escape obviously like the dunker they need to learn how to use a stats if your nbcd drills ar5 i think obviously a lot of the kits changed i've been out nine years so yeah it's basically you're trying to dry, drown air crew so the navy tries to drown you so obviously the navy likes to try and drown you and set fire to you mm. Was, yeah, that, that's um, my... was that Yeovilton? Yeah, Yeovilton, I did the dunk. And I actually did it civilian as well, because when I left the Navy, I was looking at into maritime security. That's so why I did the, the, the Maersk stuff up at, or the Bosier course up, up in Aberdeen. So, yeah, it's all, it's all right. I mean, I think the first drill I did, I actually, it was only the first one, so you're not upside down or anything. So I, <laughs> I released too quick and bounced off the top of the unit. I thought, what are you doing? <laughs> but yeah, it does put a bit of fear. I mean, I, I got me, I mean, 
I was a bit anxious at first when I did it, and then when I did it, I thought, sort of fuss about. But obviously, some of my mates weren't weren't that happy about it, and obviously, we knew a lot of the, the safety divers as well. So you're trying to escape the unit, and they're trying to drag you back in by your feet. <laughs> so you're like, cheers for that, <laughs> mate. We did it right. I was so lucky. I was so lucky in my time in the Marines because a I got to do two power courses, which is very unusual. Um, won't go into that now, but anyone who's seen my previous podcast will know why. Um, but also, and, and also the paracourse thing, I've got to just say this, but in the Marines, they think it's really hard, Sean, to get on a paracourse. And it's not. It's like literally you phone up the course and go, can I come? Yeah. They go, yeah, come next week. <laughs> it's it's that freaking simple, right? So um, there's that. But the dunker drills thing, we didn't do it in training. It's normally part of your 30 weeks at Limston. And for some reason, something crossed over and it was like, sorry, guys, we're not doing dunker drills. So, of course, you're all like, Ugh, shit, you know. But when I served on HMS Invincible, uh, it's a lot more relaxed. And, of course, you can just phone people up and sort yeah. courses out. And that's what we did. We phoned up Yeovilton. We all, we all went down there put on those skateboard helmets <laughs> and uh i'll just tell you one one funny thing so down the, the friends at home you've got this mock-up helicopter airframe and you're all sat in it and there's a there's a doorway about yay big you know two foot by two a foot by two foot it's it's small and it's to simulate the window of the helicopter or the porthole or whatever whatever it's supposed to be called and uh the machine goes down into the pool all the lights go out it spins around like anything up to three or four times and then in that disorientated mode while you're still trying to hold your breath you've got to wait for each guy to go out that that window one at a time so if you're number three you can't just go you got to wait for number one number two and then you go and we had one um we are one of these evolutions where we all came up we're all happy and dandy the lights come on but our corporal ad was missing and um in that moment you think he's drowned don't you you think oh my god we've, we've lost one you know, survival of the fittest ad i'm sorry mate but come on no they pulled the machine out of water on the crane the limit. 80s in the window going. <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't had time to get out. <laughs> so incredible. Incredible. But um how was it for you, mate, and when you when your dad goes off down to fight a war? So, I mean, it, it was weird because, I mean, obviously, I think, obviously, I was going to school in, a, we lived in Brecon at the time, because obviously my dad was at our employment. So I got six weeks out of school. So basically, my mum and me, my, yeah, my brother, so we went down to Bromley. Because I'm, I'm, I'm from Bromley and Kent, not that I've spent a lot of time there. So we went me to Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so we went yeah. to go. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm from Bromley and Kent. So, yeah. So, yeah, I went down you're supposed to, go. to You're supposed to say, Chris, you're awesome. <laughs> I've been a problem lately it's changed quite a bit isn't it god it's not like don't remember it like it was in the 70s and 80s god. but yeah so basically went down to uh, stay with like uh, my aunt and uncle which was obviously my mum's mum's brother and then obviously my grandparents were still alive at the time so it was just obviously so my mum could be close to her family whilst obviously my dad was transitioning down to the Falklands and I was, it was quite I would say funny but I, think I used to draw pictures to him like people jumping out aircraft with parachutes and stuff and shooting people out and obviously my dad would get this stuff and I think he was saying God, look at my son sent me out to like conflict on the paper but yeah it did it was it was a big thing because I thought all right I was only nine but you still, even at nine you know what obviously war's about you know, there's enough stuff on the news and stuff in the papers you know and yeah it wasn't it wasn't good for you and that's why obviously my mom thought it's best to take me out of school because it's quite a big thing so transitioned back to Bromley with a shed load of homework for six weeks. I think I did some of it. <laughs> but yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't easy, but I think it was good that I could, you know, write to him, you know what I mean? Yeah. How are you doing, Dad? Blah, blah, blah. Send him some dodgy pictures and 
that was sort of like lifted morale a bit. But obviously, as the years unfolded, I, I re- realised you know how it affected him, etc. So, did yeah, you, I, I was did you, Did you cry when he went off to war? I honestly can't remember. There's certain things I've blocked out. I think. But honestly, no. I, I do remember when he returned. Obviously, the, you know, he obviously ball bagged when he when he come back. I, I, I remember his face to this day when he come back because I think my auntie met him when he returned on the Canberra at Southampton. I think so. My auntie went down because obviously we were in uh, Brecon. So and then when he he come home, I just seen his face and that. He was just I was pleased to see him, but he was more or less like fuck off. You know what I mean? <laughs> So, yeah, I honestly don't remember crying or anything when he went. I probably did. Yeah. But there's that bit. I just, I just remember, obviously, when it all kicked off, Dub was gone, and then I'll get it from me. Uh, and, you know, I could, there's some, some things that are still vivid in my, mind, in my mind. Some things I've obviously chosen to forget about because, obviously, you can hang around in this darkness and not get anywhere in life, etc. Yeah. So... Sean, I guess what we're talking about is he's come back and he can't be present. The all important present that we all keep hearing about from our life coaching, you know, kind yeah. of stuff. He he can't be present because his mind is still back. Yeah. You know, in, in the trauma of the Falkland you know, and what, and what he's experienced. And, uh, you know, we've all, we've anyone, no matter who it is, has probably experienced that to a, degree you know you go on a bloody holiday to ibiza and you you i don't know your dad or your missus or someone picks you up from the airport you're like yeah yeah and it was like this and, blah, 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 and it's all about you know you're, you're you're like still there right but of course in with the falklands it's not freaking ibiza is it it's it's very dark no, um, you definitely want your money back if you went there wouldn't you <laughs> What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd say you'd say those pills were shit. <laughs> um, what? 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 Do, do you do you remember what your dad was like before he went? What? What? What your relationship was like? I think it was still a bit. You know, I think I do remember. I lived in Albrofe in uh, Mary Quarters. I think I was about six. I, I remember him probably still being a bit volatile. So I think he was of that nature anyway, because, you know, I, I found horrible to have to as a child. You know, we, my granddad was in the RAF and he'd lived out in the back of the something happened there. So I think before the four things, he was a bit problematic anyway. And when I lived in Malta, I think that was four, when I lived in Malta, and obviously I don't remember a lot of stuff, I've seen the pictures, but my mum said that he was a bit, a bit of a man. And this, you know, I was only about, I don't know, one, two. So... With certain traits and behaviours and aggression, etc., moisty conflict, and depending what you're witnessing, it's relationship. I think he tried because, like I said, I used to spend a lot of time up in Condor's workshops, and that was great. I'd be mean, painted with toy cars and I'd be done welding stuff and beating stuff with an anvil. But just every now and then you do something, he'd just flash big style. It's like a mercury tilt switch, you know what I mean? It's like, what the hell have I done? You know, I've done something really trivial, I'm going to get my head ripped off. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now what we're seeing is signs of generational trauma. So he's clearly, he's experienced this as a child. This is coming from your granddad. Sorry, I'm sorry to be like blunt, but no other fuckers talking about this, mate. And somebody needs to. Yeah, I think, and and I and I I'm I'm not holier than thou because I see that in myself with my son. Yeah, and I have to stop myself, and occasionally I can't stop myself, and and it's awful, you know. You I, bloody shout them out, and they've done fuck all basically, yeah. except, except be a kid. Um, and yes, and of course the recruiting pool for the military is very much people that not not a hundred percent, but a significant proportion have had very damaged childhoods um so i'm just trying to build a picture here sean for our audience you know um it's not it's not all war and tea and biscuit and medals and rambo and and all this it, it it's it, it it's horrible yeah. it's horrible yeah. 
it wasn't great. My, my childhood was shit. I mean, it wasn't always bad, but luckily for me, I could get out, climb trees, I know, get up to no good one, go swim in rivers, you know, playing fields and stuff. And I had some good friends. And I never, it's weird because I never really spoke about a lot of stuff because you, know, you get to school in the 70s, 80s, teachers weren't that good either. You get slapped around the head, locked in cupboards and stuff. Do you know what I've done? <laughs> That's what Jesus Christ. Well, it's like I had no one to talk to. You know what I mean? Mate, I'm just sorry. I'm I'm talking a lot because I just want to make sense of all this. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Childhood in the 70s was very abusive. School was incredibly. Yeah. You know? Um, some of the things that teachers did to me in school. If they were to do that in this day, they'd get like five to eight years in prison. No question. No question, you know. But back then it was completely acceptable. Yeah. And of course, for somebody like yourself, you don't need to be having this abuse in school because you're already going through this nightmare at home. Yeah. And it's it's the ultimate in unfair, right? Yeah, it wasn't great, but like I said, it's weird because I, I, I think I was quite resilient. Yeah, I, I scrapped at school, especially when you're moving from, say, like Plymouth up to Scotland or Exeter, they back down in the Dorset and you, you speak like a jock. You say, I'm from Bromley and Ken. I was forever fighting. And, you know, I get into some <laughs> dust up, go back. I mean, I was at a young age, I don't know, seven or eight, go home crying. That's like, oh, I'll give you something to fucking cry for. I've just had four, four lads, three years older than me, beat the shit out of me. You know what I mean? And I'm coming home getting a new one ripped. I'm like, this is great. But I think I did. I think I just thought, fuck it, I don't give a shit. And they just cracked on, did what I could. But like I said, for me, I think things all come to fruition. Well, the chickens came to, home to roost when I was in my late 30s. And it, well, the bottom fell out of my world. You know what I mean? I was like, what the fuck is going on? Because I obviously bottled stuff up. I said some things to my wife. She met my dad before he passed away, met my mum. And I said, look, my, when I first met my wife, I said, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. So I explained a bit about my childhood and everything. Her jaw went like that. Uh, she couldn't believe it. And then she always tried to get me to stay in touch with my mum and this and that. I said, look, I'm done with it. Just no fucking interest, to be honest. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it did affect me. And if if I said it didn't, I'd be a fucking liar. I mean, Sean, were you watching like the the coverage of the war? It was quite fractured because obviously I think the Marines told the BBC to fuck off that you know yeah. you're not coming. I think I've, seen, I've seen bits and pieces of it on the news and that, and then like, obviously uh, the Sun newspaper, the Sun says stick up the junta and stuff like that. I remember stuff like that. I remember reading a few bits and pieces. So yeah, I'd seen a few bits and pieces, but I wouldn't say I went out the way to watch it. I yeah. think for me. It was just like, as long as I can write to him, get some dodgy pictures sent to him, and then that's that's my bit. Because again, you, you know, it's it's quite a bit to get your head round. And like I said, I can't remember everything from. I knew where I lived, obviously, when the fort was kicked off, Breakin in uh, Breakin in Scotland, obviously Angus, and obviously coming back. And then just as each year went by, how my dad got progressively worse. You know what I mean? And. Like I said, going, you know, it was it was each year. And obviously, I know. It, he still tried because I know when we'd left Scotland and he was drafted to pool, you know, things were pretty bad at pool. But he would still say, Look, do you want to come to workshops? So I'd go to metal ship, metal smith workshops with him, put some rivets and stuff. And, or I'd go and spend a bit of time with the illustrators going like drawing and stuff. So it was good, but then it wasn't, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I so did it. It, was, it was weird. It's just so complex it's like how can you like hate somebody and love someone but that's how i felt and you know i don't hey listen do look every little boy sorry girls out there i i i'm i'm i i'm talking as a little boy we we loved our fucking dads you know yeah. we loved our daddies that that's he's your daddy mm. and that's some of the behaviors you're too young. You can't make sense of it. And what? So what you do is you internalize. You think, oh, I'm wrong. I'm. I've done. You know, this is me. And then we carry that for lives until we finally run ourselves into the ground. In my case, it was through chronic addiction. Um, I know you've got your story, Sean. And that when we reach that bottom moment, fortunately. Um, if we don't kill ourselves first, 
we have a moment when let's just fucking call it God speaks to us or <sighs> mother nature sends us an epiphany and, and, and we wake up and we realize, hang on, this isn't our fault. Yeah. This isn't, we've done nothing in this, you know, nothing. And yet we're carrying this burden and, and we got to stop it now. We got to start looking after ourselves and, you know, loving ourselves in the way that, that we weren't when we were kids. And we, and, um, and that's, that's why you see people make, you know, huge, huge changes in their life. And, and, you know, I'm talking to someone now that, that clearly has, but yeah. I, I, but I want to take this one step at a time, mate, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm equally curious, but I'm equally keen to, you know, get, get the full picture here. So had anybody made it clear to you that like your dad's in an elite force, he, he, you know, I don't expect they'd say the nature of the scraps he's going to get into down there, but that he might not come back. I don't think anyone actually did, actually. I think I was aware of it. I think it's weird. I think I was quite perceptive as a nine-year-old, thinking, yeah, if he's going there, I might not see him again. I think I was aware of that. I don't think anybody had to spell out to me. You know, I think I was always aware of see Royal Marines do, et cetera. And it was always funny because being at school, when you had to write about what, what, what your dad does for a living, so I'd say Royal Marine goes on exercise, blah, 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 blah. And so, yeah, I think it was aware. I didn't need people telling me that you might not come back. I mean, like I said, I can't, it's, it's trying to picture a lot of stuff because I obviously go back to get all your shit together, you go to a Bromley for a bit and then get back home and then your dad's back. And then it's, for me, you know, obviously I remember pit, bits before it went down. It was always afterwards as he, each year went by, how, which is more pertinent in my brain, I expect. Yeah, I've got it. How, um, Without, I, I don't want to give any like personal detail away, but w was he scrapping on the mountains down there? It's a bit, I mean, because I, I found some stuff because I know he's four or five enough, but I think he ended up being a metal smith. I think they were attached to the logistics and that, but I do remember Fletch saying a few bits and pieces, obviously, when they're obviously shooting at aircraft and so obviously shot a few things out of the sky, etc., and then obviously changing out there, etc. Just people getting blown to bits, or I think there was some ship stuff as well. It's like it did because obviously I got a lot of this when I was older. You know what I mean? I was probably about you know just before I joined the navy, etc. And he, he said about people getting blown to bits. You know, one minute somebody's there, the next minute they're gone. And this is either on, on a ship or shoreside. It's like you know people get you know there there they are, and then obviously somebody's screaming in agony, half their heads missing, and stuff like that. And I thought, well. That's going to affect you, isn't it? But then I think going back is stuff. The damage was already done with my dad a while ago. And obviously the Marines does like to breed aggression, but obviously channel aggression. It's not about obviously going out. Well, that was another thing. Obviously, he did like the, the old dust stuff in the pub, coming back with black eyes, etc. So obviously that's another thing in the mix. Think, oh, hello, Dad. Why out here? And... Mm. Yeah, it's it, it's hard obviously having, having a chat about it because obviously I don't want to say, oh yeah, he was, you know, an evil whatever, but you know, that's how he well, portrayed well, himself. Yeah, but we've already established, mate. He, you know, yeah. he was a damaged person, like, exactly. and, and and I, I'm exactly the same as your dad. I've just, you know, life has been better to me in the respect that I've been able to get a grip of it all, you know, and I'm, yeah. I'm. This is not. This is there's no judgment on this podcast. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it. You know, we can sit here and fucking slag off this person and this celebrity and it's just yeah. shit thing to do, you know. I'd rather, you know, try to get some truth out there. And um, you know, you, you, you we've already established that your dad's most well, you know, it's not it's not for me to say, but if I had was a betting man, I'd say I think he's had a quite a damaged childhood himself. I think he's probably joined the Marines because it seemed like a, you know, a good, a good way out of things, a good chance to prove himself in, in, in life and, and, and achieve. And there's no, there's no shame in that, but of no, course, exactly. all, 
all the time that you're not, you haven't dealt with this trauma, it's going to keep rearing its ugly head. And of course, we've already again established this was a time when people didn't speak about this. Exactly. All yeah. brushed under the carpet, child abuse, domestic violence, you know, sexual abuse, um, mental abuse, you know, w- w- whatever it might be was it, it, it wasn't really understood. Uh, people were way more worried about their public face than they were about admitting that actually like I might have a problem. Can I, can I get help? There wasn't help there for people. You had your GP who just prescribed you some fucking Valium or some shit. And, 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 you know, how does that help? And of course you had the pub and the pub was the big thing for a lot of people's trauma, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. So I do remember because it's weird because I, I went back to our growth area about twelve years ago. And I went to the Rosie Lee Hotel and that was a, a, a famous infamous haunt for a lot of bootlegs when they come back from the Falklands, a bit of lunchtime drinking, etc. I think one of the owners is still there. It was a family run business at the time. And obviously they're they're outside and then obviously there was a car backfiring and about four or five bootlegs hit the deck because obviously they are affected because they're thinking something's going on. But yeah, this lady said to me, you know, what happened obviously when they returned from the port because a lot of them uh, get together, just going to have a few wets at lunchtime and go back to work half car. But yeah, they all, you, you knew there were signs. And I, I was, like I said, I was aware of PTSD and that, I think, growing up, it wasn't called that. Obviously people would say shell shock, but it's, it's, it's definitely... Yeah, like I said, it, there's bits and pieces I remember and it, visiting, you know, our growth, Breakin and Farnham again about 12 years ago and some people are still around and then having a chat about stuff and then piecing things together and then obviously stuff like that and then obviously the family environment and that. And it, I mean, even if there was more help out there, I don't know if my dad would have gone and asked for it, to be honest. I don't know because it's that elite force in it. I don't need no fucking help, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and they're still shit at it now. Hello, Royal Marines and Navy and, and Army and Ari, you know. No, I, I'm, I'm going to say it because my mate fucking killed himself two weeks ago. That's not good. You know, and here's the thing, and, and, and anyone listening who knows who I'm talking about will agree, he's just like the nicest guy you could ever. Yeah. Got to try not to get upset here, but I went on our Facebook messages, you know, and... um the last picture of him was holding up my book saying, great read, Chris. Thank you, mate. You know, and, and he was a high ranking non-commissioned officer. So it was quite nice for me to have that, you know, that support from someone in quite a senior position that fucking loved me and my charity stuff that I do. And, and, and it was a very special. Um, I won't say how many children he left behind, but it was significant. Yeah. And, and you know, we need to get this sorted out. Because he could, he could have come here. I wouldn't have given a shit if he'd knocked on the door at 12 o'clock midnight on my fucking birthday, Christmas. It doesn't matter. No, no, I, I understand. I mean, it's... No, he could have fucking slept on the couch and we could have talked through it and we could have sorted it. And I can't believe, and I know I fucking speak for loads of people. Yeah, it's not... There's just no fucking sense in it, mate, you know? this, the, and, and I'm not saying we should be able to make sense, but we need to stop this macho bullshit because yeah. it don't work. No, exactly. It doesn't work with 300 suicides a year. And God knows how many in the USA. It's clearly not what, um, which, and again, it's why I'm I'm so grateful, Sean, that you've come on the show, you know? No, thank you. Thank you for the invite. I mean, it is. It's, it's hard. I mean, obviously, I, you know, Jeff Williams from obviously Veterans you know, against suicide. So obviously I reached out to him. So I'm trying to do a bit of work for him. So obviously, and the thing is, I've been working in health and social care for about six years. So I've anything from learning disabilities to autism, homelessness. And then obviously I did a brief spell with the NHS, you know, working in psychiatric units, and various hospitals, homeless patient advisor, and then learning disability and autism team and doing a bit of support work. But I've been working for Cornwall Rural Community Charity since ooh, July last year. And obviously my, my job is massive and varied. 
and do deal i do get some referrals from what courage i've got somebody i'm working with now which i'm trying to get sorted out and it's just trying to link all that stuff up but it's still disjointed and it's not working you know so i'm in the process of trying to reach out to other cics etc you know people like jeff you know everyone to try and put it together just so you've got more of a layered safety net because people are still slipping in there and people aren't talking i mean a lot of my my clients are mental health and i can build up a good rapport ready then signpost them some people you have to but they just don't want to talk and then it might be text phone call email that might fall down you can't contact them and then it's a welfare call please you know what i mean it's and I can't just forget about some. I've had sleepless nights a whole lot because I'm thinking, has was I the last person somebody spoke to and they've ended their life, you know? And it's always going to resonate with me because obviously my dad and obviously people I've known, you know, somebody I knew in the Navy ended their life last year, about six, seven years ago. I worked with an RFPTI when I was a Sibia for Boston Down, he ended his life. I was like, and it's, I think it resonates with a lot of people. Obviously, it's, close to a lot of people some people will block it out not talk about it but i think talking here if you can get somebody to talk that's half the battle but it's getting that person to talk sean do you, where did your dad come back to did he come back on the camera yeah he'd definitely he'd definitely come back on the camera yeah because when he come back i laugh i got a souvenir brochure of the camera obviously i had some argy gizzards as well some folding shovel and an argentinian's helmet and a book of the camera i thought mm, i think it's probably a little bit different than it, you know what i mean nice little glossy brochure yes could you imagine if the camera had a full contingent of holiday makers on it at the time it's, sorry folks we, we, we're not going to Barbados we've got to divert to an island called the Falklands in the South Atlantic and by the way you're, you're in the middle of a war <laughs> well that would, that would have been carrying down at Falklands wouldn't it that would have been a carry on film yeah. <laughs> the, of the worst variety yes I mean... yes but let's again I'm going to give another shout I think I did this with when I spoke to Jeff Williams the other day yeah. um, they were civilians on those cruise liners that you know they weren't big roughy toughy rule marines they 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 were stewards getting handed a gpmg and saying how do i fire it not not because they didn't want to but because they wanted to they were like tell me how i can support the boys you know um um incredible my my cousin um hello brian if you ever get to watch this my Cousin was the lead steward on the QE2. All right. Yeah. You know? um, funny, actually. Anyone that remembers Wicker's World, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, did a, they did a QE2 special, and my cousin was the captain of the football team at the time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Brian was down there. He was bloody Falklands, for God's sake. He's a steward on a cruise liner. Um, amazing. So y- y- your dad come back into was it Southampton wasn't it I'm pretty sure because my, my auntie Margaret's sister I think met him you know when obviously he had come in obviously yeah. we were back we were back in uh, yeah Scotland and I'm sure yeah we were yeah so I think Maggie she went and seen him but, and you're um, all you're all excited to see your dad and you're saying that he just wasn't you know he couldn't be there yeah, but the thing is, obviously, the transition down there, obviously, the conflict and then the transition back and then obviously travelling then from Southampton back up to Scotland probably would have been a nice putter's bone shake, wouldn't it, back to bloody four or five or whatever, and then probably then a drive for him back to Brecon. So I understand, you know what I mean? But obviously, when you're that excited little kid, wants to see your old man because you didn't know if you are going to see him again, etc. And he did not look good. Yeah, of course. And, and, and these are the moments that traumatise us. These, these are, you know, as an adult now, I bet you look back, you can remember it like it's yesterday. Yeah, there is. It's weird. It is what I do. There's certain things I obviously I can't remember and other things that are clear as day, you know what I mean? You know, what he was wearing. Because I know my dad, when he used to go to work, say with his obviously putties on and stuff like that, when he used to come back before, before the complex, I, I would take his putties off and stuff like that. That's things I did, you know, this was just like bonding time it was so there were good times but then i just think again as the years passed it just all that started to leave me i think because it, it was just not a good place to be so that's behavior got more 
aggressive and violent as the years went on? Yeah, definitely. It was sort of like, you know, I, I mean, I, my son's 18 this year. And I, there was no way I would speak to him. I mean, yeah, I do. I, I, I've lost my rag before and I then think, oh, hang on a minute. That sounds familiar. But yeah, it was. I mean, didn't think twice about calling you a C-U-N-T or grabbing hold of you, you know, like that. And it was just, mm, great. And yeah, you're a kid, aren't you? You're going to get up to no good. But I don't think I was that bad, to be honest. I wasn't sort of like, my brother was a bit more problematic. But again, you know, it was, I'm well, nearly eight years older than my brother. So I'd, I'd witnessed a few more bits and pieces before he did. And then over time went, because of the dysfunctional family, my brother had to go to a corrective boarding school in Romsey because he, nobody could handle him in school. And my brother is very damaged. He, he was the one that, tried reviving my dad when he was 16, you know what I mean? He, he wants to be trying to revive an old man at 16, you know, and he's, you know, he's 42 now, I'm 50 this year, and he's... What, did he, he's did it, was this a drinking thing or something? No, no, this is obviously when he was, when my dad ended his life in 96, he, he'd overdosed on Coproximal, so my, okay. my brother tried reviving him, white, white spew come out and stuff, and then things... I was lucky. I was based at Cold Rose. I was 24, not 16. You know what I mean? Can, I we, just... yeah, can we just take this one step at a yeah. time? You say Coproximal. You don't mean co No, it's Coproximal. That he'd, he'd, what, uh, what kind of meds is that, if we can just... That is the painkiller, because obviously, I don't know, are you ever familiar it's with like... DF-18s? That seems to be quite a good thing yeah. for boot necks when they're in pain. So I, people... I didn't know Coproximal was opiate based um and i'm not trying to be pedantic here folks it's it's just it, it um i suppose it's very similar to overdosing on paracetamol but it's a bit stronger than that i mean I, I don't know the ins and outs of it but it was definitely coproximal because that's what he's prescribed because he had you know a bad left he had a, a knee operation in the marines which wasn't the best ah uh, hang on it's it yeah, it's it's dextropropoxyphene hydrochloride. So it's um in the opiate family. Yeah. So you know, opiate morphine. Yeah. Um, reason I'm asking is, w w it, it, if you're a drinker, heavy drinker, and you're on that shit, it's quite easy to die accidentally. It, w was that ever established? It was, a, it was intentional because he tried in 95. But I was doing the cenotaph and Lord Mayor show in 95. And I, I tried to get over to go and see him. I spoke to him on the phone. He sounded really, really bad. And he told me that he tried in 95. And I couldn't because obviously I was bloody Lord Mayor show on a Saturday, front and center, the cenotaph on a Sunday. And then obviously a year later, then. So I found, because when it all happens, I've obviously got some time off. I was based at Cold Rose at the time. I went to Mottingham. That's where we were living. And I found half a suicide note. And it started, I mean, I think my brother was with my mum, my mum had moved out. So I'm staying in this house where it happened. And I found a suicide note and you could see, I said, like, sorry, can't hack it anymore. And then the let, it just, and then that was that. And there was still voicemail messages on the phone as well. So I'd be picking the phone up or whatever, phoning. And then my dad's voice is still on the phone. So yeah, it was definitely intentional because obviously 95, he tried it and then, yeah, obviously if you're pissing up and popping meds, but if you're leaving a suicide note or half of one and then you, you pass pass away, then that's that. And it, like I say, it was the coroner's report was a death by suicide or... Yeah, fuck. It's... Um, and sorry to push the point, but was you... Um, I'm kind of assuming your dad was drinking. He drank a lot. I mean, the thing is, he was, I know, I mean, because when he was a civvy, he worked for a 24-hour recovery company, so obviously, obviously he wasn't drinking and driving. It was when he was coming back, smashing in some beer. And then, you yeah, know, I'm guilty, because obviously when I used to come back on leave, I would, would go and have a few wets. But sometimes I didn't want to go over and leave. And the only way for me to get on with mum and dad at the time, because of all the shit that was going on, was to get fucking shit face and then go back to the RN and dry out, you know, which isn't good. But it was bizarre because well, I, I'm not long being in the Navy, I went over for Christmas leave and that turned around and called me a CUNT. And I said, look, the only CUNT in this house is you. And we had a fight, which wasn't good because my mum's screaming. 
he's got hold of me. I've I've held back. So I thought, no, I'm not getting into this. You're my dad. So I, I stopped my bloody elbow through the bloody living room window. I was like, for fuck's sake. But if I stop going back on leave, if you say, I, I joined the Navy at 92. So I still, I passed that training or the old weekend. I would go home and see my parents, but it was still conflict and stuff. I'm scrapping with my dad, I'm scrapping with bloody civvies in the Prince of Wales and Moscow. I thought, this is shit. You know what I mean? And that's obviously one of the reasons I joined the military. Sean, are you, are you aware now that when he's calling you this stuff, he, he's projecting himself onto, he's seeing you as him? Yeah. And he's feeling, yeah. he's feeling the hatred that his dad, not hatred isn't the right word, but. Yeah, but his, my granddad, it wasn't, obviously with my dad's trauma, it wasn't granddad. I mean, obviously his upbringing was probably quite stiff off a lift and that, but it wasn't, you know, there might have been some things, because I think my dad was a bit unruly, but it was what happened to him, you know, probably sexual assault from not a family member, obviously thinking where he lived at the time. It was that, and I didn't know that until I was like 19, something happened to him horrible when he was like five. And I, yeah. I found it out when I was like 19. And then obviously I was like, ah, fuck. So then everything, Falklands, abuse and all that went into my head. I then got more and more angry with myself because I thought I could have supported him more, but I didn't like him, you know what I mean? So it's quite, yeah, quite a lot to keep that around, you know, when you find yeah. other stuff out. Because obviously, child eyes, adult eyes are two different things, but obviously you're the same person. Yeah, I, I'm. Again, I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to highlight how it is. You know, when a person's just so uncomfortable in their own skin and they're feeling, right. feeling such a sense of worthlessness. And that their whole life's been a fuck up and a failure. To forget fucking marine, that you can get a green berry. That that's doesn't you know, that that doesn't change things from deep down childhood trauma. And then what happens is when you have your own child, you start projecting your feet. You start to see them as you in your eyes. And when they, for example, you know, go to hit the nail with a hammer and they fucking miss. That's that's you missing that now, and you're like, oi, fuck, fucking hell! It's not that f- y- you recognise this, right? It's not that fucking dip. You fucking hold a fucking nail and hit the fucking nail. You know, it, it 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 it's 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 not even projection. It's it's seeing that person as 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 the extension, and and I, or, but I also want to say is that doesn't take away the love that they feel for you. It, yeah. It, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a, it's a curse for them. You know? I, I knew all that. Cause I, I need to speak as well. I think I'm trying to think. Cause I mean, I did, I did feel good in 96. I was up at old school. My dad did come up to old school. I mean, I was injured. I crushed my fingers. So I was working behind the bar. So my dad come up. He was fucking absolute shit face. Back in mind, you've got boot necks up there, paras, all sorts, you know, girthers. And it, it was absolutely trollic. And I can't remember because then my soon to be wife come up to visit him uh, later on. But now, I then went back up again. I think I went up back up by myself just to see him. And we sat down, had a few wets, and he said, I'm sorry I've been a shit dead, Dad. And this was sort of like mid, mid-96. mid And that was the last time I, I spoke to him, sat down, he burst into tears, he went, I'm really sorry I've been a shit dad. And then obviously December 96, gone. And it was like, hmm. But I knew he did, but it's just because he was so, he was ill. Like my, like my brother said, I had a chat with my brother yesterday, and his words were, I didn't know about PTSD, I thought he was just a CUNT. I didn't realise he was ill. I said, so I said, to my brother, I knew he was ill, but still thought he was a bit of a C-U-N-T, you know what I mean? So it's, I knew, but it's just hard, isn't it? It's when you're growing up with it and you want to move forward. Yeah, and, you're like, and you're like, I, I did, I fucking hated him for a while because there was, when I was about 15, when, we after the, when I was 14, when I'd seen what I tried to do with my mum, about a year later, he, it's 87, I think, my dad was on resettlement. So he's working in London. They come back to pool. And then he come back and he really wasn't fucking happy. I was 15 at the time. And he fucking grabbed hold of me, called me a CUNT, had a, had a plate, did up with a plate, triangular piece, cut in the chin, 
I went like that. I was gonna honestly, I was gonna knock him on his ass. I thought you can get the fuck off me. I went in the garden and we had a pile of pile of wood on a rabbit hutch. So I picked this fucking pile of wood up, threw it across the fucking garden, got hold of a six inch nail and fucking bent it out of pure fucking anger. Because I thought I, I don't need this shit anymore. Mm. So obviously things calmed down a bit again. And then we then left pool when I was about 15, moved to Mossingham. I mean, things I don't know, it's weird because things have died down a little bit when we're in Mottingham, not a lot, because obviously then with us transition from being a Royal Marine to city working on building sites, etc. We're in Mottingham. I thought South East London, I do not want to fucking be here. I've got a good bunch of mates back in pool. And so I was in my last year at school. Things had died down a bit. My brother has been a bit of a, a what's it? I think he put he put a ball through somebody's he'd been playing outside in the flats in Mottingham. <laughs> stuck a football through somebody's window, obviously smashed it. Fucking dad's gone out. Yeah, you C-U-N-T. We grabbed hold him, fucking laying into him. I'm about 17 that time. I'm like, get the fuck off him, leave him alone. You know what I mean? And it, it was things, because we used to grow up with German shepherds as well. I mean, dad would beat the fuck out of the dogs as well. You know what I mean? It's not, you know, you're hearing your fucking four-legged friends fucking yelping and stuff like that. And it's, it's just, it was everything. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, the effing and the jeffing, the, the physical abuse, the, you know, <laughs> resistance to interrogation. You know what I mean, it, it was just not good. And, <sighs> and I knew about because I think mostly hospital, I think, is the child psychiatric assessors, I think. I, I do remember I'm trying to think how old my brother was. We lived in Pool. We had to go and be assessed. So we're all sat in this room, obviously the old mirrors and stuff. They'd ask us questions, and I thought, well, I was thinking to myself, do we need, need, need to sit here? The family is fucked. That's why my brother's fucked, you know what I mean? But we're all fucked. And that's, you know, it wasn't easy. And I didn't, I'm a bit more open now about talking about things, but I, do, I still do, obviously, don't want to just slate him because he was my dad. And it's hard because, you know, I don't repeat myself. We need, Love someone, but you hate someone. It's that how. Hey, let's, mate, I'm going to interrupt you there. We're not slating anyone. Yeah, yeah. We're highlighting. No, no, that we're how high, you know. Yeah, I, 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 of course, I get that. But I just, you know, it's really important we understand that pretty much life is set up to traumatize most people. Just like, if, if you don't believe, if you don't believe me, go and read a beauty magazine, mate. You know. Uh, Go and read a beauty, you know, go and watch any Hollywood movie. You think it's about the hero? No, it's not. It's designed to tell you that you're a fucking failure yeah. and that and that your life is shit because you haven't gone out and boxed Apollo Creed or you haven't gone out and shot a load of people up in some forest in Vietnam. Believe me, set up to traumatise all of us. And we're not here to slag anyone off. No, I understand. We're, we're here to highlight the fact that once we start to understand this, life can be, you know, we, we, we can um, get life better for everybody. Yes. So I keep interjecting here, Sean, because um, there's so much. If we keep playing the traditional story, no one learns from it. We all yeah. just think, oh, my dad was this. Oh, and, and, and. But if we can like make sense of it, we can yeah. all we can all all learn and and um, and we can all. It, 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 the reason I'm saying this is a, a real big thing for me to be able to move my life on from the point where I was dying. You know, I was yeah. in, injecting drugs twelve times a day. I wasn't going to last much much longer. You know. And it it wasn't until I was able to frame it all for yeah. what it was, not not what I thought it was, what it was, that I was able to start going. Oh, I hadn't considered that before. I had I hadn't thought about my parents and what they went through. I hadn't thought about the fact they might have just been fucking crap at dealing with life. Yeah. through their experience and once yeah. i understood that then i started to feel really fucking sorry for them you know really 
just pity that the shit that they must have been through and you know you can apply that to any anybody that's caused you harm yeah um and so yeah i just think it's you know important to sort of establish that um gosh <laughs> now in typical chris Thrall style i've completely lost my train of <laughs> train of thought um no that's it. you don't you don't understand it once because obviously you go around kind of say well somebody's this somebody's that and you don't know because everyone's got a story haven't they? but everyone deals with stuff differently don't they you know some people are a bit aggressive some people are introvert or you know it's people react differently in certain circumstances don't they? it's like run away you know from it head on you know happy medium <laughs> yeah well Maybe. i think what it is is i get you know when i talk like this very often i get a reply oh yeah but i'm never forgiving them. and it's like yeah fine but then you're never going to move on ever no, exactly. you're yeah, going to exactly. be stuck at that four-year-old yeah. or six-year-old or 15 what well, you're going to be stuck there for your life and now you're putting that on your kids yeah you've got to be able to unpick this make sense of it, go, ah, right, I get it now. Okay, yeah. wasn't about me, it wasn't like, you know, I was about, no, it wasn't, it was circumstantial. Yeah. And we can smile at the morning sun and fucking move on into and, and a great, great life where we're happy, we're, we're as balanced as we can be, we're productive, we keep our vibration high, we, we we, you know, we put out a good message to other people that that, that they can that they can empathise with, and I can see that you've all, all already done that. So, <laughs> probably saying this for the sake of the podcast, mate, rather than you, Sean. Um, but how how did you find out that your dad was dead? Well, basically, I, I was around. Uh, well, we seemed to be in Law's house in Penzance, and I had a phone call. Oh, I think his mum said. Uh, so my mum and dad had split up by this time. She goes, oh, your dad's in hospital. And then I was like, oh, great. And I knew, because obviously having found out about 95 and then the, the feeling in my stomach and then in about an hour, hour later, mum phoned back, oh, he's, he's, uh, he's dead, which I saw, like, I knew it was going to go that way. And then, so next day I had to go to blown work. So I was sat in the crew room at Cold Rose and Mississippi's. <laughs> I got a bollock, oh, get your fucking eights on. So I said, my dad's dead, and burst out laughing. So I know his row looked to me, he was like, what the fuck? So I then spoke to my chief, I said, uh, I think I need to go home because uh, my dad's uh, taken his own life. And it's like, so I think I ended up with about three weeks off. So I went home, sat in the place where it happened by myself, drank a lot. <laughs> and it was weird because I was numb. And then I'd gone there for a bit. And then I think, I can't remember if I stayed up for the funeral, I had to go back, I can't remember again. So some of the, my dad's mates, not not loads of people came because some people got the dates mixed up, people were pitching up late and that. So, yeah, obviously went up, seen him in the coffin, etc. It was weird because I wasn't, yeah, I did cry, but I wasn't sort of like, I think it was worse when I found out, when my, I had an aunt who passed away about 10, 12 years ago, cancer. And I think I was in more more emotional at that funeral than I was at my dad's because you're right. So yeah, phone call Mate, from sorry, the I should just explain I'm I'm weaning myself off uh, bloody opiates at the moment for my ruptured disc in my back and it's um <coughs> God is it there's ever a lesson you can learn folks it's, it's not it's really not nice. I'm, I'm trying not to it makes you sneeze like mad which is really weird but um <coughs> Sean, sorry, sorry, mate. Can carry on. Yeah, I said obviously I found out by a phone call from my mum. I was on my girlfriend's parents' house at the time. And then obviously went home on leave for a bit compassionate. And uh yeah, it was a weird few weeks. I had to obviously stay in contact with my, my chief. You're right, and obviously some days I was pissed up. I'd ignore the phone call. Because I was, I was just sat there. I mean, you didn't get any counselling or anything. I had no counselling as a kid for childhood trauma. Nothing. <laughs> Your dad. Obviously, there are people you go and see. Obviously, maybe first put a call for a lot of people in the horses is go and have a chat with the bish, you know what I mean? And then take it from there. But when you're a bit messed up and you don't know what to do and you 
you're being a bit problematic in the forces, drinking too much and getting up to no good, then you're just deemed as being a screw in you. So <laughs> that's Sean the thing. Tal- <coughs> God, excuse us, mate. Um, <coughs> um, you, tell us about the funeral because I'm guessing his oppos came. Yeah, I can't remember. There was a couple of people that I thought would have come, didn't come. I can't remember. Did I think? Oh, Rabbits was, came, I think. Was it, a, was it a military funeral? Well, he did, because I, I was a poor bearer. I mean, my brother was going to do it as well, but obviously he was like, oh, no, so somebody else. So carried it. I wasn't really carried it in, obviously, last post afterwards. And then we went, and because he, he got cremated. And well, what happened, what happened was, Jeffro, uh, in 96, what was supposed to happen, because he, he's from the Lake District, his ashes were supposed to be scattered in the lakes. But no, nothing ever happened. Because I think... What my dad thought was if he ended his life, it pulled the family together. It did the complete opposite. So mum said she was going to go to the Lake District, scattered his ashes. Three years passed. I was on the Fearless. So I went home to Mortigan, got his ashes, took him back to the Fearless and said, can I do cumulative ashes? So got a casket made. We just left Gibraltar and then obviously committal of ashes ceremony in 99 off the coast of Gibraltar because I thought it was very out to be an ex boot neck, et cetera. So, yeah, all my best mates of 4F2 helped and that, but got a slab of beer afterwards. But, yeah, it was just the funeral itself. Some people pitched up. Some people didn't because the dates were wrong. So it was military-ish, wasn't it, ex boot necks? Me and Rig as a mat load, carried a coffin, last post, off to the crematorium, and then awake in the Prince of Wales, uh, a few beers, but I drank quite a lot, and then got a bottle of woods rum, got my, my sailor's hat out, did a top for everyone, and then that was about that. But I think because it wasn't really laid to rest, or everyone was still mixed up and in turmoil and couldn't express anything, everyone was a bit numb or didn't really know what to say, then I, I I'm felt... Just, I, Sean, the point I'm sort of getting at is... Oh. And again, I'm just saying this for the sake we can all maybe learn something is these events can be so hypocritical. You know, all the military want to turn up and, blah, and medals and all that. And, and, no, and it wasn't like that. It was quite a low key thing. Obviously, you had some people like Royal Marines Association, et cetera, had medals on and stuff. I think maybe the, trying to think the boat plane, the last post might have been from the Royal Marine Association. But yeah, it wasn't like, like that, you know, it was quite a low key endeavor. Just, yeah, okay. Just my my mate drunk himself to death, and he's ex bootnet. When I saw his funeral, which I couldn't go to, I on the one hand I had some stuff on, but on the other hand, when I saw the massive gig that they were putting together, right, you know. I, like the full Monty military funeral, almost with, you know, Marines flying in on trapeze and all that sort of shit. (laughs) Sorry, I'm joking, but it was like I was the one that watched him drink himself to death. Yeah. And when when he did, he had about three people rocked up at that hospital, you know, in, in his last two and, and suddenly, but for the funeral, all these people come out of the woodwork and it's a big fucking bonzo, fucking bonanza, Royal Marines fit. And I'm like, hang on, where was all you guys when when we've been trying to get him to stop drinking for the last three years, you know? Yeah. When his body was just like bloated, his face yeah. was green. He's, he's about 20 stone in weight from the fluid that is kidneys and lungs uh, liver can process anymore and i'm not i'm not this is not sour grapes or anything mate i'm not trying to bad i understand where you're coming from i'm I'm just trying to say it's it's we 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 do the kind of you know tradition stuff really well but we we miss like the important stuff yeah yeah the Um, emotional the the well-being type stuff in it yeah attention 
And not just that, you know, it's like when someone's drinking themselves, what are the what do people say to them? Oh, yeah, fucking have another beer, mate. <laughs> it's like, oh. Well, <laughs> I know, because obviously, I mean, my brother's, you know, I mean, we've all probably had a bit of a problem with drinking beers and that, but I had to reach out to my brother because he was like posting on Facebook, happy fucking Sunday, having a beer at fucking 10 in the morning. So I, I texted him yesterday, how about doing a post with a uh, happy fucking whatever... I'm drinking a pint of H2O and he did, but then come the evening, he's doing the same fucking thing again with beer. But he's calmed it down a bit because he told me the, the other day he was drinking 20 cans of beer a day and he was on obviously antidepressants, painkillers. And I thought, fucking hell, here we go again. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. Mate, some of us have been there. I can tell you it was a lot more than 20 cans of beer. Well, if you include the bottles of rum... <laughs> And yeah. and life can be good after it, you know. This is this is what we're trying to get to here. No, exactly. Yeah. I, I want to pick up on a point that you mentioned, and and I hope I hope that a lot of people watching and listening can put their troubles to bed when we mention this. And You know, you you said when your dad rocked up at the Royal Tournament when you were there and said, I love you and I'm a shit dad. That, he was trying to set you free, you know that? Yeah, I know, I know that. And it, it's, because obviously, you know, you're just awkward because, oh, I don't know, I'm fucking laughing. But yeah, I know, I knew, I know he was. And I know he was trying to make peace with me. And that's he, obviously. He, he was trying to say, son, there's nothing wrong with you. It, it's me. That's what he was yeah, trying to yeah. say. I, I, I got that loud and clear when I had that chat with him. And it was just, I mean, I you know, I'm guilty because I thought I could have done more for him, but I, I resented it. I had this obviously inner turmoil with myself. Well, I could, but then it's still, it's tricky for me in early 90s and that mental health stuff and that, in the Navy, it was still plans. It was still plans 10 years ago when, or 12 years ago. Oh man, I'll fucking sort shit out. Oh, fucking cheers for that. Fuck you, fuck you all. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Just to any, again, to our friends out there listening, to anyone who's struggling, just remember, it, it, you've done nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, and if we can embrace this point, then we can all just go, oh, yeah, there's actually nothing wrong with me, is that? And we can just move on. Literally. Literally. I, I'm very mercenary sean i i don't deal with the past why because it's in the fucking past i don't give no, a shit exactly. you know yeah, move forward yeah. you know i and i can be clinical about it you know when when my best mate lee died died on our holiday like literally i watched him die pretty much uh, drowned in dra drowned in the end after a i won't even go into it but it was a one hell of a night um, and I'm sat there next to his dead body on a beach in Portugal. And uh, I kissed him goodbye. And I fucking went on and lived my life, mate. It's that simple. You know, did I carry any guilt? Did I? No, fuck off. I went on and I lived my life. Why? Because it's all you can do. There's nothing nothing to be gained by trying to establish an identity in the past, yeah. especially in trauma, you know, and all those people that have gone before us, all they would want for us is for us to go on and live our lives, you know, and, 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 um, and you clearly are doing, you know, you clearly are doing. Yeah. Um, is it, you've got to try and move forward. Yeah, I have a few glitches here and then. Obviously, going back to a person that needs a bit more coaching and mentoring because obviously, when people are racked with guilt and they can't change their mindset, which I know it's, I think it is easier for some people, harder for others. Talking, you know, if people can just talk and, you know, it's not obviously all pink and fluffy stuff, but just reaching out. If somebody's in clip, as they say, just pick up the phone and speak to someone. You know what I mean? Because I do think it helps rather than, you know, you know, silence, you know, radio silence fucking out, you know what I mean? That's that. Absolutely. 
And again, a great message you're putting out, mate. Anyone out there now, if you're struggling, pick up the phone to someone, share it. You know, you won't be the first person. Make sure you get the right person. Some people are not, yeah. some people just, you know, they're, they're going through their own shit. They don't, yeah. maybe not ready for it, but, um, you know, share it because times can seem so tough in that moment. But you got to remember, you are massively loved. Whether you like it or not, you are fucking massively, massively loved by by so many people, by the universe, by nature, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just we're not very good at, exp at putting that across to people in this culture. Right. And, and tough times don't last. They literally don't. And you look back at them when you come through them and go, fucking hell, God, can't believe my life's so good now. And it used to be like that. And here's the thing. Your life is only so good now because you went through an experience and you lived and you learned by it and you used all of that to, to help you form your own mind and your own opinions and, and how you want to behave, you know, with, with, with your family um, and such things. So Sean, mate, God, this has been a roller coaster, eh? Seen a funny old week this week because obviously that's a, I was at a suicide prevention meeting the other day and I explained what I'm trying to do, obviously, for veterans, etc. So that was <laughs> started off there, obviously, this. And then I'm doing a, a coffee morning on Friday for Jeff and I need money from that. We'll ping to Jeff. So yeah, it's been stuff that I need to do. You know what I mean? I wouldn't shy away from it because I know things need to be said and for me to, for my own sanity. And I mean, I deal with stuff anyway. I don't, you know. Don't let the bastards grind you down, as they say. But, you know, I do have my old glitch here and there. But because of this, it's important. It, the word's got to get out there. We've got to start, you know, looking after your oppo, so to speak. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just going to mention this as a like a last bit. But like I'm I'm in a completely different place now on on the journey, so to speak. Um. And I feel for people that are still back there or even people that think that they've got over stuff and that they're in a good place. You know, there's a, there's an even better place you can be. And it's when, it's when, gosh, it's when you learn to disassociate yourself with this ego identity that's been thrust upon you from birth which is, hey, I'm Chris Rawl. I'm a my birth certificate is this number, and my national is there, and I've got a driving license, and I'm I'm a hit with the chicks, and everyone, I I've got a lovely car, and I bought it. This it's fucking all a load of horseshit, right? That's such such a bullshit identity to live by. The better identity is when you realise that you're actually part of the universe. You know that the molecules that make up you, Sean, and the molecules that make up me. They've been here since time immemorial. They ain't going nowhere and they will be here for all eternity, right? We are simply the universe experiencing itself. That is it, right? It's these corporate trillionaire nut jobs that have, 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 have carefully uh, um, brainwashed us into thinking that we're this little identity called Sean and Chris, and that's all we are. No, we're not. We're so much bigger, you know? And when you realize your universe, not Chris Frull, life becomes different. Why? Because if your universe, you've seen everything, you've been everything, you're here to see, you can't worry about shit. Because if you did, you'd have to worry like about everything, dude. <laughs> you'd have to, like, you'd have to, you'd have to worry about ebb and you can't you just sit there and you observe and you enjoy and you chill and you just feel an immense sense of gratitude that that you know that 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 you're here and yeah in our birth certificate identities it's not always easy we upset people well tough fucking shit and that you know who cares um we we're not always going to be liked you know, that that stuff can be tough to deal with. 
But when you raise your consciousness to realize there's something bigger going on here, which you are an equal part, whether you like it or not, um, the you you're above the trauma. You're above the care in what Karen said on Facebook. It, it, you know, in fact, you probably won't be going on Facebook, but all that much. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say that. And anyone who wants, you know, who's keen to learn more, um, get in contact because I can help you with that. Um, it's, uh, you know, we get one life, Sean, and I've always tried to, I wanted everything, mate, you know? Yeah. wanted everything I, I did everything in an attempt to find out my answers I guess when I look back it was you know why was my childhood different to people's that's that's probably why I've taken so many drugs probably drunk more like I said more alcohol in one day than most people do in 10 years um, it's why I've thrown myself out of planes learned to fly them it's why I've picked up a automatic weapon and, and patrol for a major city in Great Britain or Ireland, depending on your perspective. I don't give a shit. Um, you know, willing to kill people, willing to, uh, it's why I've been a smuggler, international traveler, adventurer, why I put myself for university. It's just all, all on the journey, trying to make sense of what, because, and, um, and gosh, it's really easy. You just don't need to do any of that shit. <laughs> Although I would, I would do the skydiving if I can recommend it. Um, no, you don't have to do that. You just have to sit with a sun on your face and realize you're perfect. You're perfect part of the universe because you are the universe. It's, it's that simple. It's that simple. And yet some people will go their whole lives suffering yeah. um, because they cling to that identity. Yeah, but I'm a this, and my dad did this, and he did that, and then he did this, and did it. Will fucking let it go, fucking move the fuck on, right? Stop trying to create your identity in the past. You know, if you think people are feeling sorry, you know they're not. They're probably like, you know, pitying you at worst, babying you along at, 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 at you know. That's not your identity. There's, there's, there's a, you know, it's one step at a time. We have, it doesn't all come to you in one day. Um, but um, leaving the past behind and, and understanding is a, is a big part of moving forward. You know, understanding that your parents probably didn't have it easy. You know, they had their horrors to live through. They was just doing their best. Jesus Christ. People used to have babies, mate, didn't they? Back in the day at like 20 years old. Now, I couldn't be trusted with a child till I was 45. <laughs> well, I think, I think my mum was 19 and my dad was 22 when I had me. And obviously I was about 31 when my son was born. So and i got to admit, I thought, I don't want to be a fucking father. I think I said that to my, my wife at the time. And then obviously... Things happen and that. So, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll give it a go, shall we? <laughs> you want to hear my funny story? All right. <laughs> my son, I don't give a shit. He's the biggest legend in my life that I'm ever going to meet. He is literally the most handsome fella I think has <laughs> ever walked the planet. He's the funniest fella. And he's welcome to do anything he wants in this life. If he wants to fucking wear women's clothes and dance on a Saturday night in front of drunken sailor, it, that's his, his fucking choice, right? Um, all I would ask of him is don't hurt other people. Yeah, um, don't, don't hurt other people. That's all I... Anyway, as such, <laughs> yesterday in the middle of our barbecue, he stands there and he looks at me and he's got that testing look, you know, when the kids want to test you. You know, test their <laughs> test their boundaries a bit, yeah. and he says, uh, "Dad, yeah, Klingzy, right? Klingzy's, um, Klingzy's a sloth, a little cuddly sloth that I'm not sure if it's his or mine. I think I got the, Dangler is the little boy of the sloth. That's mine. He gave that to me, 
we gave him Clingsy. I think that was it, right? So yeah, he's got this cuddly toy called Clingsy. And um, he looked at me, he went, Dad, Clingsy said you're a bastard. He's seven. He's <laughs> seven. <laughs> I laughed my fucking ass off. Why? Because we've got to stop this intergenerational fucking trauma shit. You know, yeah. we got to live, learn, smile, be happy, not put it onto the next generation. If he wants to come up with, with that, um, um, yeah, I, I, I literally have no fucking issue whatsoever. As long as he's happy, as long as he's not hurting people. Sean. Any links you want to share, brother, send them to me. We'll put them below this video. Yeah, um, I'll do. I mean, I'll, I'll get some stuff. I mean, it's just obviously, it's just trying to do a bit more with Jeff, etc. And then, like I said, I'm all for like trying to get more peer support together. And the idea is to sort of like get a directory together so people know. We know, obviously, the NHS and healthcare systems are overstretched, etc. So trying to work, even if it is, I do. If we can make 1% difference, then it'll be a little bit, you know what I mean? But it is going to take a lot of time and effort and obviously suicide prevention just a small part of my job but it's not you know what i mean it, you know the people i talk to some people are so yeah i'll, I'll get some stuff together and but yeah, it's just you know jeff's a good bloke you know he'll help anyone out etc and yeah, i'm doing other bits and pieces to raise awareness and it's just it's going to take time but you know at so least it's something that friends at home jeff williams W02 Jeff Williams, Royal Marines. Um, very nice chap. Been a long, long time friend of mine. We've done a, you know, some cross charity working together. He, he is the chairman of a group called the um, VUAS Veterans United Against Suicide. He's the first person in the country that has pushed the government to release the statistics of how many veterans are killing themselves, because obviously the government don't want you to know that. And uh, he's a man that's put himself on the line, um, taking a great deal of shit, as you do when you try to do the right thing in this life. And, um, and uh, we'll put those links below, Sean, OK? Yeah, dude, I mean, that's probably a good port of call, because obviously I... My regular contact with Jeff and that, and it's just stuff all that build on and then get something which is, obviously most people know about Saturday and Bull British Legion and uh, all call signs, etc. But Jeff's generally a good point of contact. I'm happy to point people in the right direction as well. If they, if they phone me up or drop me a message, etc. You know, because otherwise it can get a bit messy. Some people won't reach out, as we know. But, yeah, I, mean, I am working it, obviously trying to make things a bit, easier to access when people are waiting for gp telephone calls etc because obviously what's happening is people are relying on volunteers you know yeah which you know, should that be happening it's, it's good that we have volunteers to do that but in this day and age really you know what i mean exactly. Everything is exactly. fragmented and distorted well off the back of what you're doing off the back of the podcast um we will we will help some people mate that's no doubt you know i get a lot of emails to say thank you so don't ever think what you're doing is not appreciated because it it will be by someone somewhere um you're not always going to hear about it and it might not be immediate it might be something that you and i have said now that will just be in someone's mind and in 20 years time when when they're staring down off a fucking rooftop it might be the thing that they go ah hang on what do those guys say live in the present and it let the past go smile at the sun move on and remember that we're fucking brilliant that's it and who gives a shit we're all human we all make we all do stupid things i still do every single day right but it's not about that it's about real you know realizing that we keep going Exactly, yeah, moving it's forward, great. yeah. It's a great life. Just sometimes it can seem a bit shit. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sean, it's been great, man. We'll put those Thanks links so below. 
Um, just stay on the line so I can thank you properly. But yeah, r- really, uh, I'm so proud of you for being the first person to actually like come on the fucking podcast and just talk. Um, you know, just shows the barriers in society, doesn't it, about just talking. Um, and uh, I'm really proud of you. Um, I fucking know your dad is proud of you. Um, and you've done him proud, mate, you know. And uh, life's not fair, folks. But nobody ever said it should be. Exactly. Once right. you grasp that, everywhere, everything else is up. Massive love. Thanks very much. Cheers. Welcome, mate.